The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Let's talk about an all-star cast in not quite an all-star game. The Freddie Prinze Jr. Jessica Biel vehicle summer catch. What the fuck? Um, Hey everybody, this is Michael T. Bradley. J. Wilford Neville. And we are here today to talk about something that uh, a good friend of mine who is uh, who works in the film industry and uh, has written multiple screenplays, none of them as of yet produced, uh, but some optioned, disproves a maxim that he gave to me, which is you can't fuck up a sports movie. You can't do it badly. It is Summer Catch, which... I had never really heard of. I don't know if this counts as a rom-com or a sex comedy. What, what do you think, Wilford? I'm not sure. It's maybe sort of a little in the middle. Maybe comedy isn't the right word. It's Maybe it's just like a, a romantic it's a sex. It's too strong. Yeah. Yes, it's a, ro- it's a romantic sex romp. <laughs> and we can get into some more uh, details about that in a minute. Uh, first, let's go through a basic plot synopsis so you guys know what's going on. The plot synopsis is not going to be difficult because this movie, oh my god, I thought this movie should have been entitled Algebra because it was so goddamn formulaic. (laughs) It hurt me at times that these really talented actors had to say lines like, you have to get over this fear of success. <laughs> you fear yourself and your success fear. You and just have to let yourself be great. I just wanted to do nothing this summer. Well, I guess I was that nothing. <laughs> I mean, it just, it, it, the level of stupidity with some of these lines just hurt me. It really just felt like everybody phoned it in from the screenwriter to the director to... Like, for instance, Matthew Lillard, I don't think he realized they were making a movie. <laughs> I think he was just hanging out, fucking around with people, and they were like, do we... Are we even paying him? No, we did, he's not even on the casting sheet. Fuck it, let's just keep rolling. Yeah. It, it, in any case, Wilford, if you want to try to put some sort of uh, meaningful spin on, on this plot synopsis, go for it. So the formula basically goes A equals... Poor local boy who has a shot at the big leagues. B equals rich girl with a disapproving daddy. C equals major league baseball scouts all over two. <laughs> two is Brian Denna, he's the coach. You d- multiply the whole thing by X, which is Matthew Lillard is the douchey best friend of our protagonist. But that's basically the plot, right? Yeah, there's like a kid who doesn't believe in himself and has a shot at the big times and is in love with a hot chick who's rich and uh, is, you know, trying to get over personal tragedy and has fucking uh, ridiculous central casting stoner friends who believe in him despite everything else. And I mean, I mean, it just it's it's every bad cliche about these sorts of movies rolled into one with very, very, very little new to add to the genre, to filmmaking in general. I mean, there was not a single moment that rose above anything else in this movie. It's almost as though they'd heard the adage, you can't fuck up a sports movie and gone, just you watch us. (laughs) Challenge, buddy. I hear a dare in that. Let's start in with our what-the-fuck moments. Uh, Wilford, if you want to start them out. Freddie Prinze Jr. running through the sprinklers in a bright orange thong. Fifteen minutes of quote-unquote comedy, all based off of that one thong gag. Dunkin' Donuts product placement in a baseball locker room. To make sure that I am in prime physical shape for my first day of intense training for a professional league sport, and and to make sure I'm not late as well, I'm going to sleep on the cold, hard ground the night before. Roofie. Oh! Keeping score with the KKK. And your classic sweater-vested rom-com villain. And I think Freddie Prinze Jr. at one point just reads a line off of the back of a box of life cereal. The sweater-vested rom-com villain is Bruce Davison, whom I love. Freddie Prinze Jr., whom, I mean, I like. I don't, I don't dislike him. I think he's talented, and um, I, I think he seems to kind of have a uh, uh, self-effacing sort of humor about the kind of roles that he generally gets uh, placed with. And anybody who dates 
Sarah Michelle Gellar, I think, has to be kind of cool. Uh, his dad is Fred Ward. The girl he wants is Jessica Beale, who is now shown up in multiple uh, What the Films here, which is kind of sad because she seems very talented as well. I'm trying to think who else. Uh, the, the sports, uh, uh, the what am I, what am I call it? The the scout talent scout. Yeah, the scout is John McGinley of Apocalypse Now and Scrubs fame. Wagons East. Uh, we mentioned uh, Brian Dennehy as the coach. Right. Uh, Brittany Murphy doing her best impression of one of those dolls that its eyes are open and closed when you lay it down and stand it up, that one of them's broken. What? <laughs> uh, she just, like, no there's the first scene that she's in, it's like one of her eyes is stuck open, it seems like, and she's one of those creepy I... dolls. I did not notice that. Uh, she got she got a lot of the, the first 15 minutes... As I say, the only real joke there is the fact that Freddie Prince Jr. wears a thong at one point, and we see his ass, and I guess that's like to hook the ladies. But it, it's it, it, there's a lot of weird gender bending. Brittany Murphy gets that shot twice in the movie, where she essentially is is shot so she has a penis, beer bottle penis. Yeah, and then Freddie Prince Jr. He like has only her clothes, and right, and she does the same thing to Matthew Lillard too. She's got some kind of weird fetish going on, I think. She likes to seduce men and steal their clothes. And she has the line with Matthew Lillard, "Oh, my butt was just in your face," and he or he says that, and she says, "Did you like it?" And he's like, "Yeah, I always like a butt in my face," and it's it's a little odd. And then Matthew Lillard is incredibly uncomfortable about someone saying something could, that could even be construed as gay to him if it's a guy. Right. Obviously, as we mentioned here multiple times, Matthew Lillard is in it. Mark Blucas is in it, whom I love from Buffy, and I'm, I, I guess I'm kind of glad to see him getting some work. Wilmer Valderrama. Beverly D'Angelo makes a an uncredited cameo. Who was she? I didn't... She's the Mrs. Robinson character. Oh, I thought she looked familiar. All right. Yeah, she's in it fucking a cucumber, I guess. Being fucked by a cucumber. Right, is the implication. It'd be one without the other, I suppose. (laughs) It's it's an old, tired, but true country classic. (laughs) This movie just kept going on, and every five minutes I would go, holy shit, this person's in this movie? I love them. Why are they in this movie? I was kind of surprised to see Brittany Murphy in it, actually, because I didn't, like, she's not on the cover... She's not in the trailer, and so like there's oh there's Brittany Murphy oh I'm sad now. I I really think that whoever made this movie they were one of those fucking Hollywood like thieves who got lots of personal shit from different places you know like remember when there was that big bust like Lindsay Lohan got her stuff stolen. I think these people these filmmakers got shit on all of these people, <laughs> and it was like all right John McGinley. Unless you want this picture of you, like, fucking a lamb to go public, you're going to have to do this you're role. You have to come phone like... in this movie in a pair of suspenders. <laughs> and he's like, well, I guess I've done worse things. And uh... Like fucking that lamb, for instance. <laughs> it was a youthful indiscretion, okay? we can... <laughs> Let's just get past the lamb fucking. <laughs> but yeah, it's... Oh my god, this, this just... Uh, I, I, there was nothing redeeming about this film, and even the what the fuck moments. Really, the biggest what the fuck moment for me just kept occurring whenever I would see someone really talented pissing away their <laughs> afternoon in front of a camera for this movie. Like we said last time, like the biggest sin that a movie can commit is to be boring. And yeah. this movie manages to be formulaic and boring. In every way that can possibly be imagined. I thought at first that it was going to be just this wild, crazy ride, because I don't know if you got this impression at all or not, but it starts out with narration, which is, I fucking hate that. Well, let me say this. Narration very rarely works. Narration is generally there at the beginning of a movie because the scriptwriter is lazy and wants to tell, not show. And I say that, and my favorite movie starts off with narration, but... Is uh, what? It, 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 super. Narration can be done really, really well, but I think one, at least one very big thing that you have to do, you have to start and end with narration. Yes. 
can't just start with it and then end with the rain shot of everyone high-fiving and hugging as the camera flies off into the sky. Right, even if you're just going to give some bullshit like, you know, that was the summer I learned to love or whatever, <laughs> you know? You have to have some sort of wrap-up so that it isn't just killed in Vietnam. <laughs> So that it isn't just some sort of stupid fucking like, hey, I got to get out a few character names here because we got to get in the movie, but I couldn't really be asked to write a scene about that. So the thing that I noticed with the opening narration is I thought that it had multiple narrators because it goes from Freddie Prince Jr. talking and being like, hey, I got into the minor leagues and I got to, you know, hey, this is here's the setup of the movie and shit. Right. And then it cuts to Matthew Lillard and some other guy uh, getting out of a car, and I, I guess it was just a bad audio edit or something, something we know nothing about here, <laughs> but it really sounded as if it was a different narrator, and I was like, oh my god, are there going to be multiple narrators in this movie? Because that is going to get confusing as shit, like, really fast, and then it was like, no, it was just a bad edit. Like, there was an edit after the first couple of screenings, and they needed him to redo parts of it. But he's like, I'm not coming into the fucking studio again. I'll just say it over my <laughs> cell phone. Fire up that tape recorder. Hold it up against it. The other thing that I really thought was a big what-the-fuck moment is the climax of the movie. He's pitching this no-hitter, and he's uh, he's almost through the game. And... Uh, the, the Jessica Biel chick who really should have been out just destroying North Korea, but instead was fucking around on Cape Cod for the summer, basically comes by and waves at him because she's going away. And, you know, it's really sad because their love is so fucking deep and shit. He stares at her leaving and there's this weird black and white right. replay of all the things that she's said to him and all the stuff that they've done through the movie. The entire seven minutes worth of conversation that they've ever had in their <laughs> lives. Yeah, almost all of the movie's dialogue actually gets flashed back during that last game. There's all these weird-ass audio flashbacks with reverb. It's like every single line gets replayed. And they did that a few times throughout the movie with him, but they never did it with visuals until that point. And I honestly thought for a second, wait, was she a ghost all along? <laughs> yeah, because it's black and white and it's all film grainy and they've added a dark vignette to the edges and stuff. And it makes it feel like it's this big reveal. And the reveal is just he realizes, I like her enough that I should like go after her. And so he goes after her, but then that, but that's it. I mean, there are some weird moments and, and some weird things in the film. You know, like, for instance, the, the, the editing in this movie is really poor. I mean, the scene-to-scene the -scene continuity, I think, is okay. But there are some big edits where it's like, oh, there went part of a scene at least. Because, like, for instance, one scene ends with Brian Dennehy, the coach, looking at him and saying, so like I said, and then it just cuts. <laughs> And it's like, you don't cut at that point unless you're like, I don't know, doing a Robert Altman film or something <laughs> where you're trying to get this weird verisimilitude like beyond what you would normally get in a movie. But it's so jarringly bad. The movie definitely showed evidence of having been massively recut, didn't it? I kind of wonder if it was either a rom-com first or a sex romp first and then they kept adding... Uh, one or the other, you know, like maybe maybe it was a straight up sex romp and they uh, screened it and it did better with women than they thought. And so they thought, oh, well, we can make it be really good with women if we up the romance or vice versa. You know, it was a simple rom-com and then the, the sex comedy stuff, the little bit that was in there got screened really well. And so they upped that. I always kind of suspect that when a movie starts out with a gratuitous and not well written voiceover yeah I always kind of suspect that a huge amount of footage got cut out in order to shoehorn in something else elsewhere in the film i always suspect that whenever a movie just doesn't have a really even tone i mean i, I and i guess that's not even fair with this one because it has an even tone it's dull <laughs> but it really does kind of feel like 
it's this sex romp and it's like well i mean you know why why do we spend so much time on the jessica beale freddie prince jr love story we spend a rom-com amount of time on it but have nothing between them it's never clear why she likes him unless she's slumming it and it kind of seems like she is slumming it yeah they don't really have any chemistry between them it feels like to me like the actors don't have any chemistry between them and the characters have absolutely no reason that they would like each other it doesn't make any sense whatsoever and no reason to i i mean he even you know after bruce davison is like let's just go ahead and cut the shit and you stop seeing my daughter because it's never gonna work you know it, it's it's after that he kind of starts questioning and he's like what do we have in common like she's gonna go to architectural school which that's like the rom-com go-to is architect oh, the girl wants school. to be an architect <laughs> Did you notice any of the other common rom-com tropes that we've been noticing along the way? This didn't really seem to have that many. Mostly, I think, because this one focuses on the guys. The, the girls are really just hood ornaments in this movie. Well, fat shaming has definitely seemed to have been a thing, and it was definitely a thing in this movie. Yes. So Mark Blucas in this movie plays a character who is into larger women. At first, they talk about how he hooked up with this chick who was big, and he's like, okay, I had a bit too much to drink, and he's kind of embarrassed about it. That scene involves the great line, she was big, huh? <laughs> Just in case you didn't, you didn't get what was going on here. Right. And then it progresses. You see him in the background hanging out with her, and she's kind of a, you know, I mean, she's a curvier woman and everything. And then you get to see a scene... Of them being intimate where he reads a poem to her and she's into the poem. It's not just like creepy, but the poem is all about like you're fat and that gets me hot. Right. And then finally he has this moment in the bar where he professes to everyone, I love fat chicks and they love me. I really was torn about how to feel about this because I felt like it was very much trying to make a, a an anti-fat shaming statement, but it did it in such a ridiculously painful way right. that just reinforces male gaze bullshit and da-da-da-da-da that... I mean, I couldn't be angry at it, but I also couldn't really get behind it. It sort of felt to me like this whole storyline, and it was one of like six storylines, most of which were gratuitous, this whole storyline of his character sort of showed evidence of like either a fight between the writer and the producer about it or between the producer and the director about it like one of them wanted to make a statement about fat shaming and the other one just wanted to fat shame yeah so it was sort of having its cake and eating its too but there's actually one key that for me turned the tide as far as how i felt about this story because like i like the character the character yeah. is fine but the thing that told me how the filmmakers felt about it was during that scene that you mentioned where they're being intimate and she comes out in lingerie number one they've lit her and shot her in order to be as unattractive as possible and try to make her sort of scarily aggressive mm -hmm. and when we first see any of her she's stepping out from behind a beaded curtain and the floor creaks quite loudly and she steps on the floor I definitely agree that there was a fight going on. For me, the thing that really accentuates that fight is the fact that uh, the bar scene where he stands up and says that he loves fat women starts out with this literally two minutes long panning shot of everybody making jokes about fat chicks. Right. And, and it's like, the movie didn't need that much. <laughs> You know, all it needed was one comment that he's like, okay, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. But instead, it's like, let's go through at least two minutes of horrible fat chick jokes before we get to this end scene. And then when he gives his little speech, he uses the word zaftig. So I was like, okay, it gains points for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that somebody behind the camera somewhere hell maybe it was blucas for all i know he was like for the love of christ guys we got to show a little bit of love here but uh somebody put in the word zaftig which i'm like you know it's like zaftig rubenes calipigus you don't throw those words around unless you really are like someone who cares about this sort of stuff you know yeah. 
So that was the the dichotomy, I think, rent large here. Because also the whole bar like erupts into cheering. Like all of his friends in the course of his two minute speech completely shift their perspectives. And now they're cheering him on for saying that he likes larger women instead of making fun of him. That sort of, again, was evidence of different writers fighting. They were just teasing him to push him into the open with his love of her. And then oddly, after that, we and even in that scene, we never see them together again. Right. That storyline is resolved. And I'm like, why? Wouldn't it make sense to see her with him different places throughout the movie? And instead, I think he just disappears at that point in the movie, and it just becomes all about Freddie Prince Jr. I felt like that was the kind of my best friend's wedding storyline in here, where it really wanted to be one thing and just kind of failed. Yeah. It, we focused on the guys so much. Well, of course, the rom-com trope of the X, third act X, coming in to mess oh, things up. Oh, right, yeah. That was actually who I was referring to as the sweater-vested rom-com villain. Oh, sorry. I uh, Yeah, what was his name? Chip or Chris or something? I don't know. Whatever. One of those white guy names. Chip or Chet, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had totally forgotten about that because he was so ineffectual as a rom-com villain. I mean, like, his entire villainy consists of putting his hand around Jessica Biel's shoulder and being like, hey, who are you? <laughs> I guess Bruce Davison was more like, what, a cardigan-wearing rom-com villain. He was definitely like the Acts 1 and 2 villain. I wonder about, do you ever think about characters' names and be like, I wonder if they're trying to make a reference there? It's funny you mention that because I actually have a lot of scribbles where I tried to give this movie better names based on the fact that Ryan Dunn is the main character's name. Mm -hmm. So I thought the boy done good, <laughs> also Dunn and Dunner, <laughs> if they had focused a little bit more on him versus his dad, right? Right. Yeah, so I, yes, I, I do look at the characters' names. I mean, I assumed they chose Dunn because it's kind of him fighting against his fate, right? It's him fighting against his own self-destruction. I think there's a specific reference there. I think that his name is a reference to 16th century English poet John Dunn. Yeah, the, the metaphysical poet, right? Yeah. Because yeah. um, John Dunn married out of his class. He married a rich girl, and he was poor. He got in big trouble for it. He actually wound up getting thrown in jail because her dad said the marriage was illegitimate. He eventually managed to prove that it was legitimate and get out of jail, but he had also written, like, John Dunn and Dunn undone. And they make that <laughs> reference in this movie. They say Dunn comes undone in one of the sports voiceover things. So that was okay. what made me think that it may have been a deliberate reference to John Dunn, but I may be giving the movie too much credit there. <laughs> This had the feeling of maybe somebody in college trying their hand at a rom-com <laughs> or a sex romp, so I think that's certainly possible. Maybe there was a For Whom the Bell Tolls reference and it got taken out or something. You know, this movie, in the end, he cannot bear to have Jessica Biel leave. And, like, literally, what is her last line about that? Like, yay, that makes me happy or something. I mean, it doesn't even track as anything interesting. Just so you know, here's what John Donne, the poet, had to say about being apart from a loved one. <laughs> <laughs> Our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but, a but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. If they be two, they are two so as, t as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth, if the other do. And I think that really sums up Act 3 of this movie. <laughs> Actually, at one point in my life, I could have recited all of A Valediction, Forbidding Morning. We just class this shit up right here. <laughs> Let's just read some John Donne for the <laughs> Fuck the movie. Some other classic lines from this movie that are just as quotable as John Donne. So you mow her lawn, now you're trying to mow her lawn? That gets even better because later in the movie he's like, I'm just the guy who mows your dad's lawn. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, did we totally forget about that euphemism? <laughs> <laughs> and he's so bad at it too. That was a, a twist on, on the rom-com trope. So we had the twist of now we have a woman forcing things into a man's mouth and... 
men don't understand simple machinery. <laughs> He's driving a lawnmower at about 45 miles an hour, sees Jessica Biel in a swimsuit, and is stunned by her ass, I guess, and mows over rose beds. And at that point, that's the point where you think he would be like, I gotta slow this bitch down because right. I want to check her out, or I don't look to my right anymore. But instead, he just keeps going 45 miles an hour and slams into a like a birdhouse or whatever. During that scene, like that's supposed to be a really sexy scene. Like if you Google Summer Cats, you'll see like 50 instances of that scene on YouTube. But the first time I saw it on YouTube, I thought that someone must have fucked up the aspect ratio because it seemed as though her waist to hip ratio was wrong. She doesn't seem anatomically right to me. I don't find swimsuits attractive at all, so it, it didn't work for me, but I think that's the reason why, just because it was a swimsuit. Nothing felt sexy in this movie, even though it was like a sex romp. Yeah. Eh. They failed at everything. They did. <laughs> Really, he needed a crab, a magical crab to watch over him. <laughs> I think that's what this movie needed. It needed a, a magical crab, though they did get the dead mom watching over him. Yeah, or maybe, inserted in maybe there. they needed a random musical number. You ready? <laughs> you ready? Sure. Yeah, sure. I got my ukulele. I, I had Valediction Forbidding Morning open here. I was like, I can put this shit to 4-4 four, four time. <laughs> As virtuous men pass madly away. Whisper to their souls to go. No tear floods nor sigh tempests move. God damn it, Freddie Prince Jr. Why could you not learn this lesson? We're profanation of our joys. To tell the laity of our love. Okay, so here's a question that I have in all seriousness. Did you think when things like, for instance, Matthew Lillard can't hit to save his life right. for the first half or so of the film, right. and it's because uh, he's moving from aluminum to wooden bats, getting used to it, and some people, I guess, have a really hard time with that, blah, 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 blah. Did you think that there would come a point in the movie where, because at one point he threatens to quit, and I thought, oh, okay, here's where Freddie Prince Jr. is going to be like, hey, let's go to the field and practice for a couple of hours, get you used to that bat. So he just pimps out Brittany Murphy. I kept thinking, okay, here's the point where they'll really, like, knuckle down and train, and this will kind of start the next phase of this movie where they, they get better through training. They're going to go and practice. But instead, they just keep drinking and fucking around through the entire movie, and then literally the way that he gets better so that, like, you know, because he has, like, a horrible game, and then there's a fire, and that's why he gets to be the pitcher at the end yeah, of the Rufio game. Rufio burns down the press box. I mean, just the paint-by-fucking-numbers sort of storyline. The thing that happens, it kind of reminded me of, of Simply Irresistible, is it's, like, literally just... And again, we get the like audio flashback of this. One day, a day will come when everything just comes together. Yeah. <laughs> and that was such a terrible. It was that it was supposed to be the speech that was like moving and you know meaningful, and instead it was just such bullshit. And it was like, come on, Brian Dennehy, you could have made up something better than this. And he was like, sorry, son, I'm just phoning this shit. <laughs> Did you notice that during the scene where Brian Dennehy's giving that whole speech that, like, it's one big tracking shot, but the camera rotates around him like 720 degrees? It's kind of nauseating. <laughs> Again, it felt like it was meant to be, like, you were swept away by the history of this character or something. Like, it, it should have been really... Instead of nauseating, it should have been very dizzying and like, oh, Jesus, like, this dude knows what he's talking about. And instead it was just like... Look, Grandpa, do you need, like, a, a drink of water yeah, or something? It's time to put Grandpa in the home. It also seems like he's just not a very good coach, right? He doesn't ever really coach them, like, teach them how to play the game better. Like, the extent of the message in this movie is that, like, if you believe in yourself, you can do anything. In fact, to the point where believing in himself somehow makes Freddie Prince Jr. able to throw a 95-mile-an-hour fastball with those skinny little chicken arms of his. Like, yes. Just believing in himself actually makes him stronger, not just, <laughs> like, concentrating and focusing. It's less believable than Popeye, in fact. <laughs> 
It's it's this is like Dumbo, but with baseball. There's the whole thing where his brother was a baseball player and he washed out and his dad had failed to achieve his dreams and became a landscaper. And he's talking about this with Jessica Biel. And he says, my father failed, my brother failed, and they just want to see me fail. And she goes, well, what do you want? <laughs> that was the stupidest <laughs> question I have ever heard. It's yeah. like, I want to fail too. <laughs> Stupid. I mean, I guess part of me wants to fail. <laughs> Jessica Biel's character was just horribly written. She was so fucking weak. I think I might have an <laughs> <laughs> They were so fucking milk toast. Yeah. Just everybody felt like they were living down to a stereotype, and it, it was so upsetting. I mean, Mark Blucas is by far the most interesting character in this movie, I think. I definitely agree. He's the one who's not afraid to say something about you know, Freddie Prince Jr. has a nice butt. Like, I'm an outfielder. I see everybody from behind, and Freddie's got a nice butt. So, if you could change one thing about this movie and make it much better, what would it be? I think that I would watch an entire movie of Mark Blucas's character. He was just a fun character, and he was, like, he was funny, and he was, he was not insecure about his masculinity. I'd like to see... A sex romp starring a evolved male character. That's something I would like to see, and I think that that character would be good for that. So, Michael, how do you fix this movie? Well, I think the way is, it's like I said earlier. All right, and that's it for uh, our discussion of Summer Catch. <laughs> this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville. Have a good one. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. 